Happy Easter. It's so good having you all here with us today as we celebrate Christ's resurrection. Just like Christ burst out of the tomb with new life, so we light the candles today celebrating Jesus' spirit within us and Jesus' spirit in our midst. No matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome in this place as we celebrate the love of Christ. The First Congregational Church of Essex Junction, our church, is a member of the United Church of Christ, and we are an open and affirming congregation. We embrace diversity and affirm the dignity and worth of every person because we are all created by a loving God. We seek to love Christ's call for compassion and justice, healing and wholeness in life. Therefore, we welcome into our community persons of every race, gender, age, sexual orientation, faith background, nationality, ethnicity, marital status, mental and physical ability, economic and social position, gender identity and expression, level of education and family structure. We invite all to share in the life, leadership, ordained ministry, lay ministry, worship, sacraments, responsibilities, fellowship, blessings, and joys of this congregation as we seek to grow together in faith and love. And I have to tell you, we have all sorts of people in this church, and we love them all, and we get together, and we seek to live faithfully according to how Jesus enters our lives. A few announcements. First, thank everyone for the flowers they donated. You can pick those up right after the service or this next week. Doug will have them there, and uh, you can come and pick them up. Also, wanted to thank everyone for making it a fantastic Lent. Uh, Lori did a great faith formation scavenger hunt that a number of families came and, and celebrated. Josh did an unbelievable job with a Good Friday service. The Monday Thursday service had people sharing a meal and having a conversation about the last meal and what it would have been like. The music for today and Good Friday services were fantastic. Today, as a uh, introit, we have Joanne's grandson, Fisher Irwin, singing. We have great numbers from Finally at First and from the Sanctuary Choir, and Carol is playing on the organ, so that is all fantastic. My last announcement is just to say that we have a new members class. If you like what you hear, if you want to be a part of a, an active and vibrant and healthy, progressive Christian church, you're welcome to come and check out being a member on April 25th. We're going to have a new members class at noon, and we will do that via Zoom. Also, after Easter, tomorrow, next week, we're going to start having members of the congregation come in. We've got 12 pews. We can sit up to about 48 people, and so we welcome you to go to the Sign Up Genius or to call Doug and get your name on the list. There's a lot happening here, uh, but today we're just going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and hope and love and purpose in this world, and we ask you to join us. God bless. Have a great Easter.
Thank you, Fisher Irwin, for that fantastic musical introit. Fisher is Joanne Irwin's grandson. Will you now please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin? Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen indeed. 2017 years ago, God raised Jesus of Nazareth from a cold stone tomb into a new resurrected life, and it changed the world. Jesus, Jesus lives. lives. From then until present day, people from all cultures, races, educational background, economic situation, and gender status have personally experienced the risen Christ. Jesus, Jesus lives, lives in us. Jesus' teaching on love still inspires us to live better lives. Jesus' healing touch still works through time and space. Jesus' sense of justice and inclusion still challenges us to live in peace with absolutely everyone. Jesus lives in the world. We come to celebrate Christ's resurrection long ago, but let us also come to celebrate Christ's continuing presence and revelation in our midst. Come, let us sing praises to our God and King.
Good morning. My name is Amy, and on behalf of the deacons, I'd like to welcome you to our service this morning. Please join me in prayer. Loving Creator, be with us as we celebrate the risen Christ on this Easter morning. Help us be focused on your word and will for us now and after the service. After this long year, as we celebrate the awakening of the earth, the miracle of vaccines, being back in church, and meeting with friends and family again, let us be inspired by the resurrection. May your example of grace, love, and forgiveness motivate us to help others and strengthen our community. As an unknown author once wrote, May the glory and the promise of this joyous time of year bring peace and happiness to you and those you hold most dear. And may Christ, our risen Savior, always be there by your side to bless you most abundantly and be your loving guide. Amen. Here we are on Half Moon Lane, visiting a couple of our great members, Don and Suzanne Foss. They've been members since, you know, about 10, 15 years, and they're great members. They always come to church. Suzanne always wears a beautiful, <laughs> colorful hat. Don currently is serving on missions, and uh, they're just great members. And we miss you. We love you. We hope you all are doing well, staying safe during this time. And just wanted to let you uh, say hello back to the congregation. Hi there. Happy Easter, everyone. Um, I think life is great. We're doing well. I hope everyone else is having a good day or a great time getting better and getting closer to being able to spend more time with family. want to talk, uh, thank Mark and the group at the office and the the support staff for doing all they've been doing this past year to keep us informed with church and just make people feel like they still have a church and they're part of the group. It's been great. We really appreciate it, and I know a lot of others do. So thank you very much. John? Yes, I'd like to uh, just say uh, send greetings to uh, other parishioners that we haven't had the good fortune of seeing this year. Uh, looking forward very much to uh, regular church services. We did have the opportunity to participate in experimental uh, service last Sunday, uh, which brought back great memories. And the uh, church is beautiful with its new uh, painting and take, uh, windows and everything. So uh, I'd like to uh, send greetings to everyone, wish everyone a very uh, Happy Easter, and uh, we look forward to seeing you more uh, in the coming weeks. Thanks. Thank you both. Happy Easter. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good morning, our children and young at heart. It's our time for our children's message. Well, several weeks ago, Lori gave you a piece of paper with a word on it. And you were supposed to color on that piece of paper, make it all pretty and fancy looking, and then you were supposed to hide it. Because this is a word that we try not to say during Lent, during the 40-some days that precede today. Because this word is so wonderful, so special, so celebratory, and usually during Lent, we want to be a little bit more subdued or reflective, a little more, let's say, quiet. We want to look a little bit more outside, maybe even think about our lives a little bit. And so we try not to say this word because it's a little too big. It's a little too celebratory. Oh, I know you're probably at home already saying the word already, just in anticipation of me letting you know what that word is and reminding others what that word is. That's right. Alleluia. The word is alleluia, alleluia. It, you know, it's a word that once you start to say alleluia, you just can't stop. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. You know, because alleluia is just a fun word to say. It's a word of joy, a word of happiness. 
It's a word that just says, woo! And that's what we are doing today, my friends. We are shouting and jumping with joy because Jesus Christ, our friend, our Savior, our teacher, he survived death. He has been resurrected. Now, some of you perhaps didn't know this, but a few days ago, Jesus was killed. But today, we move beyond that because today we recognize that Jesus lives, that Jesus defeated death and gives us all new life. Isn't that so exciting? Yes, you and I can live anew. You and I can walk outdoors now, walk in the sun, especially since it's such a spring-like time of year that just says it is new life. It's like when we, it's like when we plant a seed and then we let that seed grow and we see the plant unfold. That is what Jesus does for us gives us new life and brings us new joy. And it is such a wonderful and glorious thing to do and say. So, alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Here we are in the beautiful city of Essex town, saying hello to two of our great members. We have, uh, we have Lynn and we have Deanne McDonald. And Deanne used to come and bring her lovely daughter, Emily, to church. And she's grown up and has become a nurse and does tremendous things. And I just wanted to come and say hello and see how y'all were doing and that you're staying safe and, and bring greetings from the church and say we miss you and love you and hope you're doing well. And let you bring greetings right back to the church and say anything you'd like. Okay. Hello and happy Easter. Hello too and happy Easter on this snowy March day, April day. April? Oh, it's not April Fool's. No, it's April's. No, it's April's first or second. I don't know. It's around then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what you don't know is I'm over here at the aunt's house to. Uh, to get ready and test the service for the sunrise service. So uh, she's, she's opened her backyard to me and my wife early Sunday morning. So we will be right here again. And y'all have a great day and happy Easter. Bye-bye. Let us be together in a spirit of prayer. O eternal source of all being, we, your people, have come a long way since our last Easter. There have been many joys and challenges, and often it seems more challenges than joy. Either way, you have been the constant presence in our lives. Again, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. His resurrection is a constant reminder that hope is not dead and can never be extinguished. When we despair, remind us to hope. When we fear, remind us to be patient. When we feel alone, remind us that you are there. And to help strengthen our connection to you, we will breathe in three times. Your love draws us in, it sustains us. Empower us to work for justice and to be agents of radical transformation to help heal a broken world. Your love draws us in, it sustains us. Protect those who serve our country. We pray especially for Phil Bourne as he is deployed overseas. 
and for his entire family. Your love nourishes us. It helps draw us in. Help nourish those who have been working against COVID and trying to save as many lives from death and from getting the virus. Your love draws us in, it sustains us. Heal those who are sick and in need of healing, especially Bruce Giannuzzi, Dave Johnson, Pete Taylor, Bruce Parker, Rusty Sargent, and for Sue Wood's cousin, Jane. And in the silence of this moment, we pray for those who are known to us who are sick. Heal those who are mentioned aloud in our homes, who are known in our hearts. Your love draws us in. It sustains us. Comfort those who mourn, especially Betty Moody, the Shearers, the Sillies, the Bartlets, Paul Hyde and his family. And in the silence of this moment, we pray for those who we know who are in mourning. Comfort those who mourn, hold them. May they know that your presence is not far, but that it is with them. We do all of these things because your Son taught us how to pray through a beautiful prayer. Because God, who is like our mother and our father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I got a crown up in the kingdom, made of that good news. Made of that good news. I got a crown up in the kingdom, made of that good news. Made of that good news. I'm all gonna lay down this world. Gonna shoulder up on my cross Gonna take it home to my Jesus Pain of that good news, good news I got a heart up in a good kingdom Pain of that good news Pain of that good news I got a heart up in a good kingdom Pain of that good news Pain of that good news I'm gonna lay down this world On my shoulder up on my shoulder up Gonna take it home to my Jesus, pain of that good news, good news. I got a robe up in the kingdom, pain of that good news. Mm. I got a robe up in the kingdom, pain of that good news. I'm all gonna play down, I'm gonna play down this world. I'm gonna take it home to my Jesus, pain of that good news, pain of that good news. Good morning, church. It is good to be with you. Happy Easter to you all. Today's scripture is coming from the book of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. 
Hear these words of the resurrection of Jesus. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and they fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. It's great to have all of you here today on Easter service 2021. I wish you all were here. Next year we will be here uh, and we'll belt out Christ the Lord is risen today and the organ will blare and we will laugh and we will cry and we will worship the living God. But today for safety and for life, we're going to tape the service and you'll get it on Easter morning. The service about the resurrection of Jesus Christ starts with his death. It was a historical fact. People know the date, the place, the means, the narrative. It's attested to by uh, unbiased historians. And because of his death, the disciples scattered, they dispersed, they disowned Jesus, 
and his movement that for three years essentially ended in defeat. The women that were going to the tomb in today's story, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome, they were going to bring spices to this tomb so that they could anoint the body uh, because of the smell of decomposure. It would, would have been the last honorific thing that they did for their Lord and Master. And even the, the women that had been faithful all along, and even them doing this, they had given up hope of the resurrection. They had seen his lifeless body. They had experienced the brutality at the end. And that resonated with everything they knew about life in the Roman Empire, that it was harsh, it was brutal, and the good died young. If you challenged the power and the authority of the Roman Empire, you die. That's the way it was. And so they placed his body in the typical Jewish cave. They, the cave had a, an antechamber outside, and then it had a, about a two-foot door, and then it had a six- or seven-foot antechamber or a burial chamber inside where they laid the body. And they had the stone that would slowly roll in place, and then it dropped into a, a groove because they wanted it sealed so that the smell would not come out of the body. So it would have been hard to impossible to get it out. And that's what the women were scared about being able to do when they came to the tomb. And they arrived and they saw that it was out of the way. And they saw this man in white. And the way he dressed was uh, uh, in white like an angel. And he was talking and he was expressing power. And he said things that angels say. He said, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is a place they laid him. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And with those words, all of a sudden, boom, the life of those women changed drastically. The reality just skipped a beat. Everything they knew and believed just got challenged. Their grieving hearts, caught up in years of following a man and watching him die, just got the electric paddles of life, and Jesus came roaring back. And an angel of God Almighty just spoke to them personally. I don't know what your response would be, but I'm sure they felt befuddled. The, the word they use can be interpreted different ways. They were alarmed, they were amazed, they were frightened with a sense of awe. The words to express this sudden turn of events from the women was silence. Then the gospel ends. The women are silent, they don't share the news, they don't talk about resurrection. And the sentence ends with the word for. Everyone from then until now has been trying to figure out exactly what the gospel of Mark was trying to do, wondering where the resurrection stories were. What a lousy ending. What about Galilee? Did, did Jesus meet the disciples at Galilee? By the mid-second century, the powers that be finished off the Gospel of Mark. And you can still read it in your Bible. It says a shorter ending and then a longer ending. They, they added in uh, other resurrection stories from other Gospels because it sounds good. You know, Nobody liked that ending of Mark. But everyone still knew that that's the way it ended. By the 4th century, the Vaticanus B, the Minusculus 304 and 2386, uh, parchment papers about that story, uh, the old Latin MSK, the Sinaitic Syriac, the Armenian, the Ethiopian, and the Ger Georgian versions, they all talked about the original verse ending at verse 8. Eusebius in the 4th century said, it accurately ends at verse 8. Clement of, Ale of Alexandria, Origen, Cyprian, Cyril of Jerusalem, they all knew and they were all experts that says that the gospel ends at verse 8 with the women silent in the middle of a sentence. For ministers, it's like, what a joyous mystery. What was Mark thinking? What was the purpose and the meaning behind him doing this? And the women's reaction, what exactly... Would you, would you have said, what exactly would you have done? When your reality shifts, when laws of nature are invalidated before you, when God's messenger personally turns their attention to you, what is the appropriate response? No, really. What would you have said? Would you say, gee, thanks for the update to the angel, or 
I'm thrilled you brought Jesus back. Good job, God. Or, or maybe, how in the hell? Oh, sorry. How did you do that? Or, hallelujah, praise the Lord, if you're from the south. Or, sorry for bringing the spices for the dead body. I don't know about you, but none of those sound like they're particularly right to me. Silence in the presence of God, I think, is the best bet. Fiend Perkins from the Interpreter's Bible Commentary says that terror and amazement and silence would seem to be the normal reaction to what they had just experienced. William Lowe from the New International Commentary of the New Testament says the resurrection of Jesus cannot be explained by categories open to the human mind. Divine revelation lies beyond normal human experience, and no categories can help explain it. He continues, those confronted with God's direct intervention in the historical process do not know how to react. That's true. All through Scripture, God comes into people's lives and they do ridiculous things. Think of the transfiguration. When, when Peter uh, is up on the mountain and Peter, James, and John are up on the mountain and Jesus is with Moses and Elijah and he sees them and God speaks and they want to build tents and Jesus says, what are you doing? That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Silence, Dorothy Day says, is not a failed or inadequate response. It's wholly appropriate, for silence creates a space for the voice and presence of God to resound. She calls it a moment of holy awe. Speaking or adding our voice would just lessen the moment and make that resurrection of God and power that is beyond comprehension make it into something that we would add. The silence of the women point to the mystery, the power, and the presence of God, a being that cannot be defined or limited by our puny human constructs. When Nick's cross-country team went up to Cadillac Mountain, uh, his team, when they're seniors, they all run up the mountain and, at night, at the, at the very beginning of, of daylight, before the sun comes up and we adults are able to go up and so we're waiting up there for them and they run up and they come up and they get to the top of the Cadillac Mountain on the year that he was there and it was the most unbelievable sunrise that you have ever seen and when the sun came up and we were all up there you'll never guess what people said they said nothing they were oohs and there were ahs but words could not define the beauty of that moment. I heard no one say how much they loved the different hues of color or how each moment changed them into a rainbow of beauty. As soon as they would have said that, you would have ruined the moment and lessened the beauty and the way that one feels interconnected to the universe. And so silence is often the best response when you come in contact with God. Mark Portraying the women's silence allows the grand, unencumbered picture of God not to be controlled by human strictures, doctrines, and petty litmus tests. Mark's gospel tried to get past that rigidity in the whole gospel and, have, and move humanity to a place where we can sit in silence with God and peace with everyone else. So, for example, in the gospel of Mark, he welcomed the Gentiles, he treated women and children like equals. He got rid of purity laws. He separated, that separated people. He told those ostracized that they were precious, and he welcomed sinners and offered unlimited forgiveness to them. That was what the Gospel of Mark did. As they enter Jerusalem, uh, having the women as witnesses continues this theme as they enter the tomb. Having the women as witnesses continues this theme. Telling the women to tell the disciples and Peter affirms that despite betrayal and the scattering of the disciples, that Jesus still loved them and wanted them to be a part of, of the movement, the movement that was going to continue. And specifically highlights Peter separately from the disciples because he had betrayed him so dramatically. And when this text mentions Galilee, He's talking about Galilee of the Gentiles. That's what it was known by. He's saying, I want you to go back and bring my message to the Gentiles the same way he preached in when he was 
alive and walking around. The silence of the women can't doctrinize one of God's most powerful displays of love. Women's, the women's silence is Mark carries forward the ministry that emphasizes what Jesus had preached throughout his life. There's nothing that bothers me more when somebody says that they don't have, that somebody else doesn't have the right understanding of the resurrection. They don't understand the right divinity of Jesus Christ the way the Orthodox Christians have done it. And so they're not Christians anymore. They don't belong in the kingdom of God. This text says that that is ridiculous, that the proper response is silence. The women's silence and the empty tune clearly expresses the futility of every effort to possess Jesus. And let's be honest, humanity tries to control God and Jesus' message. They try to use God and religion and spirituality to their own ends, both individually and corporately as a church. And the resurrection, the fact that it, 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 it's so out there, that it is so different, it goes against the laws of nature, it goes against what, what the religions believe, just busts all of those efforts up. It mirrors Mark's gospel, and, and all the disciples and the followers miss the point. The second thing that Mark's, the silence of the women in Mark's gospel does is it allows the blessing to be with the people. It allows the experience of the resurrection to be left alone with each individual. Now, I've been a minister for a while, and one of the best things that I have in my ministry that I love is when people come to my office, and I've said this before, and they say, let me, you're not going to believe this, Reverend Mark. And then they tell me a story about how Jesus or God or an angel, the Holy Spirit, has actively come in their lives and changed them completely. I would guess that five to ten times a year, people come into my office and they say that. And they tell me their story. And it's usually done and tells a story about years past. And uh, most of them tell me, you know, I've never told a soul. I didn't tell my wife, I didn't tell my spouses, because it's so personal. And a lot of the people that come in are people you would not suspect. People that you would not guess that have this deep relationship to Jesus and God. And the stories would knock your socks off. Stories of power and, and forgiveness and personal and tender care with details and emotions and implications about how people were to change your lives in order to follow God. In all of them, I would say two to three hundred stories over 30 years, never did Jesus come to reinforce a church doctrine. Never did Jesus come to uh, condemn another person or another group of people because they misunderstood the gospel. Never did a person come to use a sacred encounter to prove a point or to claim a power. It was never loud or boisterous in the experience. People experienced God and they held it quietly and to themselves for decades in all. And they fed and they were fed by the Spirit and they gave directions and that gave directions for their lives. Jesus um, gave some power. I've heard a story of, of Jesus coming and giving divine power and presence sitting next to another person in a pew. They just sit there and they physically feel somebody come and sit next to them and feel the presence of Jesus there. I've heard of Jesus standing at the end of a hospital bed, not once, not twice, but three times in life when somebody was on the edge of death. And Jesus came and took the chart and looked at it. And the person never knew who it was, but after the third time, finally figured it out. No one ever saw this person except him. I remember Jesus sitting in the passenger seat of somebody's car as they were dealing with the death of a best friend. I remember Jesus meeting folks during surgery when the person had died and they had a near-death experience. I remember Jesus telling you not to get on a plane that later crashed. I remember Jesus sitting in a room with a spouse as their loved one had died and they felt the presence of Jesus holding their hand. 
I've heard stories about angels protecting folks as their cars careened out of control and they were thrown out of the car going 60 miles an hour and they stand up without a scratch on them. I've heard of Jesus coming into your darkness and banishing evil and the power that it has over one's life. I've heard of the Holy Spirit offering insight when you were stretched and asked for a way out of an impossible situation. I've heard of God's divine presence connecting you to the interconnectedness of the universe with meaning and joy and power as you watch a sunset or when you're on top of a mountain or when you're walking down the lane. Year after year, stories of power, insight, and direction. Mainly people holding on to the memory and the power in their heart. Most people say that they've never told anyone, not anyone. And it's easy to sense and see the importance of these stories in their lives, how, how it fed them, how it gave them strength over their entire lives. And I always found it fascinating that people kept these powerful experiences to themselves. There's something about the nature of communing with God in a personal and intimate way that is private that we don't like to share. Mary Magdalene and Salome and the mother of James had a similar experience to many of you. And like everyone I've ever known that have had these experiences, they kept quiet about it. They didn't tell a soul. When Jesus' mother had her experiences of the angel Gabriel, one of the most tender scenes in the scripture I love, and, and the text says, and she pondered these things in her heart. The women's silence perfectly is perfectly natural, and it's consistent with normal human behavior. Now, naturally, they shared it later, but at that moment, words were totally inadequate. They needed to ponder them in her heart. The silence and the abrupt ending and has meaning and purpose in the Gospel of Mark. It talks about God and Jesus personally engaging us and entering history and coming to these people and continuing to come to all of us. The resurrection is a reality that continues. It talks about God and Jesus being bigger than our human constructs, being beyond human understanding and comprehension. God's resurrection is a holy mystery that engenders all. And our response, and the women's response, and humanity's response to God coming into their lives is rightly silence. Words just lessen the experience. It's holy all. It's sort of like when I think about my mom and dad. They've been gone for decades now. Most of the time, sometimes I remember personal experiences when I'm telling my kids about when my dad did this or my mom did that. But most of the time when I think about my parents, I just feel them. I just sense their presence. Everything they were and who they were to me and everything they did for me just sort of wells up inside of me and it just belongs to me. I don't put words to it. It is just, it is just a feeling. I don't know if you all experience it that way too. I think that's what happened to Mary and Mary and Salome. Mark's gospel in the silence also mirrors Mark's entire gospel of breaking boundaries, exposing inadequate theologies, condemning small-minded religious thinking, and proposing a radical inclusivity where everyone is a child of God. And it highlights, this text highlights the personal, private nature of religious experience. On this Easter, I want you to do something for me. I just want you to sit with God in silence. We've had dark times this last year, and often dark times leads people, leads people to understand and experience God in a powerful and unique way. And so I want you to think back over this year and think about how God's come into your life in a powerful way. I don't want you to put words to it. I just want you to sit with it. I just want you to think about it. I just want you to open your heart to the hope of new life. And if you do so, I think that you will be like the women who silently experience the living presence of God and the resurrection Jesus. May all of our lives be enriched by the silence that God has for us. Amen and alleluia. Have a great Easter. Celebrate 
experience God and sit in the silence of that. In Christ's name, amen. Bye-bye. The Gospel of Mark ended in silence. And this meal, many of us like the service at this point to be quiet. One of the points of the sermon is that we naturally have a very personal and intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. The intention that we sometimes practice encourages us to be a part of a community, to see ourselves as part of a community. It's a little noisier, we're engaged with more people. But the communion that we often share is a communion that we give back to the people. And people like it because it's just them and God quietly partaking of a meal together and uh, talking together and being at one together. And we do that when we go on a hike. We do that when we're kayaking. We do that often in our lives. And so this meal represents the time when we're alone with God, when we can be with God, and when we can be intimate with God. We remember on the night of betrayal when Jesus took the bread, he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is the body of Christ. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, in the same way, he took a cup and he poured it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And as I like to say that this is the cup of salvation, which means restoration, for it is for all people, for it helps restore our bodies, our minds, and our souls. Come, for all things are ready. The body of Christ. Body of Christ. The cup of salvation. Come, come. And share of this meal so we can eat together. Let us pray. A wonderful and gracious God, thank you for this bread and for this juice, which nourishes us and sustains us as you nourish and sustain us every moment of our lives. We thank you for all the ways that you lead us into restoration and into wholeness. May that restoration and wholeness Lead us for the next week and for the month ahead. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Easter has become, in many homes, a time for sharing gifts and treats. Despite the hollow chocolate bunnies and filled with plastic eggs, which seem to multiply from year to year, we recognize the greatest gifts come from God, whose love is unending. In gratitude for God's gift of resurrection, we respond with our own gifts given in love. For surely the work of ministry to which this congregation is called is not to boost the candy industry or even build a shrine to a dead Savior. Rather, our ministry is to spread this good news, that Jesus the Christ lives that yes, he is risen. We share our best gifts because Jesus still invites us to follow his lead, seeking justice and acting in compassionate mercy. Our offerings, financial and other, help us share that news so people longing to connect to this God who brings life may come to follow the way of Jesus Christ. Amen.
let's be together in a time of thanksgiving. Bless us, O God, all who've offered that in our seeking and in our serving your work through this congregation might illumine paths and make the way clear for each one of us and for all who seek you. Guide us as we use these gifts to show your presence to the world you love, the world for which Jesus was resurrected. Amen. your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on high lord i lift your name on high lord i lift your name on high lord i love to sing your praise lord i love to sing your praise i'm so glad you're May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and grant you peace. May the love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you this day. Amen. Happy, Happy Easter! Easter.